topic today is uh, cultural images of God. I want to expand that just a little bit to talk about Christian images of God as well. So one of the things that this Lady Engaging Lady Institute or, uh, initiative has been working on is the interface between faith and culture. So we very much try to avoid thinking of that interface as a question of us versus them. So um, we know that there are a lot of people in our culture that are not Catholic, not even Christian, um, not churched in any sense. Um, but we really try not to think of them as the enemy, if you will. Because the culture that we're talking about is something that is inside us as well. A lot of the assumptions, a lot of the images that we're going to talk about from, from this culture are images that we have inside our hearts as well. Whether we've chosen them or not, okay, they're insinuated. If you watch television, okay, if you go to movies, these images are constantly insinuated. And um, we are responding to them sometimes without even being aware. So um, the culture is something um, that we wish to transform with the gospel in accord with God's plan. But we need to recognize in the first place that we, too, are a part of this culture. We, too, are a part of it. So uh, a good part of the transformation of culture that the bishop talks about in the... Uh, the vast and pastoral plan begins with the transformation of ourselves. We need to get in touch with these cultural images and assumptions in, our, in ourselves and evaluate how much they are compatible with the gospel. If they actively interfere with the, uh, the living out of the gospel, the proclamation of the gospel, then these are assumptions that need to be in some sense modified or reversed. And the images, I'd say the same thing. It's not easy to reverse an image, if you will. They don't really respond to um, logic. They have a logic of their own. But um, we still need to modify them. And this is the, the thing that I want to emphasize. If we pay attention to what works for us, that gives us a very powerful tool for reaching out to others. So um, the one image that doesn't work for anybody, okay, is this one, okay? And we can't afford to come across this way. We can't afford to be wagging our finger at people because that just doesn't work. People get defensive, and we're not really engaging at that point. And then the last thing I want to say in this preliminary uh, sense is this initiative is first of all about engaging other members of the church. So it's laity engaging laity. And the hope is that, um, you know, we will be in the gospel image, we will be 11. You know, the, the hope is that by learning what works, what helps us to live out the transformation of culture that we're called to, um, we can help others learn the same thing, and this will keep spreading and keep spreading. So ultimately, I am firmly convinced of this. All the brokenness that we see in this world, all of it, the sin, the crime, the evil, the, uh, you know, the persistence of war over the centuries, unjust aggression, terrorism, everything that is wrong in this world can be put to rights only through Christ. Only through Christ. So, um, that's a tall order, you know. As you well know, um, if you wanted to, he could have made uh, angels his evangelizers, okay? He did that on Christmas night, all right? The angels were the first ones to bring the good news. But that's about the extent of the use he chose to make of angels. Instead, he, he chose us. Okay? I can't explain that. I'll tell you this. If I were God, I would never have done it this way. <laughs> but that's what he chose. And um, he gave us his spirit. You know, he gave us Jesus, the teaching of Jesus, 
the grace of Jesus, and he gave us his spirit, and as far as he's concerned, that's enough. That's enough to get the ball rolling, and it's our job to keep it rolling. And like a snowball, to try to make sure it gets bigger and bigger as it rolls through the centuries. So our topic this morning is uh, images of cultural images of, of God. Uh, Brian found a wonderful resource. It's this article from USA Today, Americans' Views of God Shape Attitudes on Key Issues. So and on the, uh, the second page, they give you four images. I, I'm going to comment on these. And uh, I have, uh, I, I will insert what I have to say about this question of cultural images into this, um, into this framework. So you have four images. The authoritative God, the benevolent God, the critical God, the distant God. Okay, the easiest one to talk about is the distant God, okay? The uh, classic name for the distant God in this cultural image is deism. Deism. The, uh, the founding generation of the American Republic. You know, the people that were involved with the, uh, the Declaration of Independence and then um, a few years later with the, uh, the Constitution as, as we have it now were deists. By and large, they were deists. So uh, deism, in a sense, is Enlightenment religion. It's the religion of that historical period that we call the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment, let's do a little bit of history here, of course. Um, the Enlightenment came after the Reformation. So in the 16th century, Western Christendom split up into uh, what we today call the Roman Catholic Church and then uh, the many varieties of churches that um, typically get referred to as Protestant churches. Many of them do not identify themselves as Protestant churches, but um, it's, a, it's a better name to use than non-Catholic. But um, the only thing they have in common is their rejection of um, the, the claims of the Pope. Aside from that, they, they all disagree with each other almost as much as they disagree with us. The 16th century, this division of Christendom ended up in the wars of religion which were a real scandal, a scandal to a lot of people, uh, believers and, and non-believers. And the phenomenon of unbelief was growing in this time. But the Enlightenment, in a sense, um, involved a couple of reflections. One is, if this is all religion is good for, you know, religious people fighting with each other, then maybe the problem is religion itself. And so the second, um, the second reflection, if you will, is we either need to come up with a substitute for religion or reject religious assumptions altogether. So deism is what came out of that, um, that enlightenment reflection. So um, what the, uh, this author says, or these authors say is, um, Nearly one in four of the, uh, I'm not sure if this is 24%, yeah, maybe it is, 24%, the distant God, see a God that booted up the universe, then left humanity alone. Actually, the image that they themselves used was the image of a clockwork. So clocks were relatively new in the Enlightenment, and they were a fascinating machine. Absolutely fascinating. But they saw God as the divine clockmaker who he made the clock, he wound it up, and then he put it on the mantle and went to his den, smoked a cigar or whatever. But the idea is that the universe was created, you know, it was set in motion, and then God stepped back. Stepped back, okay? That is not at all the Christian idea of the creator God. 
and deism has no sense whatsoever of sin or salvation. So the Creator God, remember this, remains intimately involved with what He creates. Number one, He doesn't put it on the shelf and walk away. At every moment, He is conferring being on us. So He never stops creating in, in the sense, not simply that He brings new human beings into existence, for instance, but He never stops creating me. <clears throat> This is called divine conservation. Normally we refer to it as he holds us in being. But the important thing to remember is it's not static. He is constantly doing something. And of course, he's the creator. So he re it's not simply that he creates my body, but he creates every cell in my body. He creates every molecule of every cell in my body, every atom of every molecule, every subatomic particle, and so on. He creates and he holds in being. Come on in. You may have to grab a chair over there. So that's the creator God. That's the creator God. Um, and then the, 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 the whole idea of the redeemer. Um, this is what uh, this is what uh, Judaism and Christianity really have contributed to the world the sense of sin so um, it's you can summarize it and this is the problem with deism you can summarize it in an old saying and I don't know where this saying comes from but the saying is that Socrates is too much at ease in Zion Socrates is too much at ease in Zion. So this is what, what we're saying with that saying is Greek philosophy didn't have a sense of sin or salvation either. So, and the unease, if you will, that is the birthright of Zion, and all of us, you know, the sons and daughters of Zion, that unease comes from the fact that we know by God's revelation, that there is something wrong with this world. There's something not right. Things are not unfolding the way they should. And that something is sin. So that's deism. So um, let's go to the authoritative God. The authoritative of God. One who's engaged in history and meets out harsh punishment to those who do not follow him. So uh, you may remember this. Um, who's, I'm forgetting the name now. Who's the guy that has the 700 Club on television? Jerry Paul. Yeah, Robertson. Is that, yeah, that's his name. I think he was the one that said it, that 9-11 was God's punishment in the United States. So, um, I mean, just, just think about that for a minute. 9-11 is God's punishment on the United States. Um, that would be an expression of the authoritative God. So, he is engaged in history. Um, he directs history and he punishes those who don't follow his way. So... Um, this notion of the authoritative God has a lot that's correct. God, of course, is involved in history. That's the meaning of divine providence. And I'll take this a step further, and it might surprise you to hear me say this, but um, he does punish those who do not follow him. The problem is and, and the Bible was aware of this. Later traditions of the Bible saw this very clearly. Sometimes innocent people suffer. And sometimes wicked people prosper. So there's no quid pro quo for um, you know, a particular sin and a particular punishment. Not in this life. Not in this life. 
But yes, all sin is punished. And if it's not punished in this life, it's punished in the life to come. That's the real meaning of the Catholic doctrine of purgatory. That's where everything gets straightened out, purgatory. So if the wicked has repented, um, he or she will still have temporal punishment. And that gets remitted in that purification that we call purgatory, the state of purification, and so on. So in a sense, there's a lot that's right here in this image of the authoritative God. But overall, and especially when you see it focused in that contention that 9-11 was God's punishment of a corrupt society, I think um, that's a misapplication of the notion of providence and the notion of divine punishment. So, um, that, as you see the, uh, the quote there, they divide the world by good and evil, and they appeal to people who are worried, concerned, and scared. So, um, maybe in, in the form that we see it, I, I, I associate this with um, if you will, the, uh, the the radical reformation, so the evangelical, the Pentecostal, the holiness churches, and um, I would say it doesn't even apply to all of them. But that's that's where I see a lot of this mentality. Frankly, there's a little bit of it in the Catholic Church. It's a little bit of it, and, and and I think the observation that it appeals to people who are worried, concerned, or scared. I think that's apropos. So um, there, there's just a lot of that. We every every historical period is in transition, and uh, a lot of people are anxious about that. You know the transition that they see. I think we're living in, in a time of particularly concentrated change, and it scares a lot of us. It scares a lot. The benevolent God. <clears throat> so this God is engaged in our world and loves and supports us in caring for others. So the adherents uh, to this image, the people that are moved mostly, uh, most powerfully by this image, are not particularly attracted to that good versus evil dichotomy. So um, the uh, Philip Yancey, author of What Good Is God, says he moved from the authoritative God of his youth, a scowling super policeman in the sky waiting to smash someone having a good time, to a God like a doctor who has my best interest at heart. So then we have the critical God. This God... Um, would correspond really to what we associate with prophetic preaching above all. The prophet's concern for social justice. So the suffering and the exploited in this world um, often believe in a critical God who keeps an eye on this world but delivers justice in the next. So I like, I like this uh, typology, or these, these four images. It gives us something to start with when we talk about it. Normally what I have to say about this is, um, it's, it's fairly simple, but um, the people that have the most serious problem with religion, and I'm talking about here unbelievers or agnostics, sometimes even troubled um, Christians or Catholics, in, in one way or another are struggling with some version of the scowling policeman in the sky. So they think of religion, first of all, as a moral system. And don't be shocked when I say this, but religion is not primarily morality. It's 
It's not primarily morality. It involves morality. It entails morality. But in the first place, it is not a question of a moral code. So, the scowling policeman gives us the law. And when we look at the law, we discover to our dismay that mostly the, uh, the do's that the law gives us, it's a system of do's and don'ts, all the do's are about things we'd rather not do, eat your vegetables. And the don'ts are about all the things that are fun. <laughs> so, if that's people's idea of God, is it any surprise that they have difficulty with the idea? So, um, I'm not saying, you know, that religion does not involve morality. Because it does. We have the Ten Commandments. And the Ten Commandments were given us at the very beginning at Mount Sinai. So it's very clear that God has an opinion about what we do with our lives. It comes to us as a surprise because of a very, very important image that we need to bear in mind about God, and that is, he is hidden. So when we talk about God, this imagery of hiddenness has to figure in to what we're saying, what we're thinking. Now this is the way I like to present it. If God is everything we say he is, and I believe, but if he is, he is the single most important fact in this room right now. He not only is conferring existence on all of us, he's actually conferring existence on everything we do. So this movement of my hand is created by God. He's the, the primary cause. I'm only the secondary. It's huge. It's a massive, overwhelming fact. Now, we believe that we will see this in the beatific vision. We will see how much we depend on God for everything. But right now, we don't. And why is that? Well, one reason is because we are material beings. Our being is a composite of soul and body, spirit and matter. And God is not material. He's pure spirit. In this life, we can only know things if they come to us through our senses. So, and God doesn't, not directly. I can know Brian because I see him. I can talk to him. It's not that easy with God. So that's one thing to keep in mind. The other thing to keep in mind is we live in a fallen world. At the very beginning of the human race, there was some kind of historical act. The Bible describes it as an act of disobedience by the first pair. Some kind of historical act that lost paradise for us. And we live as a consequence in a fallen world, a world in which we can't see God, a world in which we have lost harmony with God, harmony with one another, harmony even within our hearts. We've lost all that. That's part of this condition of fallenness. So God is hidden. The most important fact in this room is hidden from us. So um, we, we're, we're talking about this now. We're thinking about it because we want to know more about this wonderful being. We want to know more about this wonderful being.
want to know more about you. But we want to know more because in some sense, he has already planted that desire in our hearts. And some people want to know more just because they're naturally curious. But for the rest of us in, in a fallen world, if he's hidden, we don't see it. And we don't wonder about it either. So, okay, just postulate all that. And then imagine this God making himself known and saying, oh, by the way, here's some do's and don'ts. And, you know, we might realize the do's and don'ts, you know, somewhere between 50 and 60%. This law is, is not necessarily always well done. So I'm, I'm uh, digressing here a little. The primary element of religion is relationship. The Bible calls the relationship the covenant. God created us to be in relationship with him. And then because we botched it in Act 1, his plan has been hidden from us. And he only gradually makes it known. But what he makes known at Mount Sinai is the covenant. And this is, what I, this is one of the primary images I would like you to hold on to in contrast to what we've seen here. And in contrast to the, uh, the, the scowling policeman, if you will. He wants a relationship with us. So he chose a particular people at a particular place, a particular time. No other people, no other place, no other time. That people place and time, and he made them his own. It's very clear from the way the story unfolds that they didn't really understand what that choice entailed. Because he gave them a covenant, and they kept falling away from it. So, in the covenant, that's what he said, I will be your God, you will be my people. No one else on the face of the earth has this kind of relationship. And no other religion, aside from Judaism and Christianity, has this notion of God. A notion of a God who enters history, chooses a people to be his own, if you will, pursues them through all their waywardness, calling them back to the covenant through the prophets. gives them the rights that the covenant entails. I'd like, to, uh, I'd like to focus on two things in this notion of covenant. One is, it's a Hebrew word that we cannot translate in English, not in a single term. The Hebrew word is hesed. You pronounce the, it's a very hard H in the back of your throat, like the J in Spanish, chesed, chesed. So uh, sometimes you'll see it written without the C, but that's what we're talking about, chesed. Um, there are lots of translations. In the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures, the Greek translation that we call the Septuagint, it was always translated with the Greek word mercy. I do not remember the Greek, but it was always translated as mercy. And in English language translations until the 1960s, it was translated as mercy. Um, give thanks to the Lord for his good, for his mercy endures forever. Now we say for his love endures forever. But what the Bible is saying is his hesed endures forever. This is the love that binds families and tribes together. It's an unbreakable love. 
So in English, when we use the word love, almost automatically we are all thinking about Valentine's Day. We're all thinking about romantic love, which compared to chesed is a pretty fickle thing. Chesed is sturdy. <clears throat> it is robust. And that's the bond that God is giving his people, has said. So he gives them, he gives them the right to look on him as their kinsman. He makes them his kin. And I, I want to put these words up for you. <laughs> If the word were not so watered down in English, that would actually be the perfect translation of chesed. But kindness is too mild in English. It's too mild a term to express everything that chesed is about. So this is the bond of the covenant. God makes Israel his kin, and through Christ he makes us his kin as well. It's a forgiving love, and um, from the point of view of uh, the theology of redemption, um, this is the key concept. Okay, it, Remember, we're talking about a desert people. We're talking about uh, people that existed before nation states existed, before there were standing armies or police forces. So, if my tribe would uh, come and raid Bill's tribe and uh, take away the women and children and sell them into slavery or treat them as slaves. Because of his chesed, Bill would be obliged to come to rescue his kinsmen that I'm holding in captivity or slavery. He would be obliged to do that. He could do that by force or um, often what happened was he would just come and buy them back. Buy them back. He would simply pay for them. And that, the word redemption contains the Latin word for buying. Caveat emptor. Have you ever heard that expression? Mm -hmm. Let the buyer be where emptor means buyer. Redemptor is the one who buys back. And redemptor is the root of our English word redeemer. So it's a sturdy love, it's a forgiving love, and it's a love that we can always count on to come to our rescue. This is what God is pledging to his people. And as part of that, this is the second observation I wanted to make about it. This is something that's lost to us in English, in the English language. Any of you that know Spanish, have ever studied Spanish or French, same thing applies in German. Um, there is a polite way of addressing people in the second person. So in English, we just say you to everybody. But in Spanish, you would only say two to a limited number of people. Your familiars, they're called. Your familiars. Everyone else you would address with usted. The same thing applies in French, it's two and vous. In, uh, in Italian, it's two and Gosh, I'm forgetting. Lay. What is it? Lay, that's right, lay. And I even know how to do it. <laughs> but I forgot. In German, it's du and z. So um, the nearest equivalent we have to that in English is we, we talk about being on a first main basis with someone. So chesed, by pledging his chesed, God gives these people the right to address him as two. In, in English terms, he puts himself on a first name basis with his people. So that's the covenant. 
And that's the heart of the covenant. The heart of the covenant is chesed, not the Ten Commandments. And that, I think, is a struggle for Catholics, and probably most of you in this room fall in this category, for Catholics who were raised to be good little boys or good little girls. We know the rules, but we may not have as strongly effective a sense of the reason for the rules. The reason is love. And I use a very simple analogy to try to make this point. Every significant relationship makes demands. Period. So, all those silly things you see in movies and television shows and you hear about in certain kinds of songs, popular songs. You don't have to be free. Um, I'm going to move on, you know, as soon as... <coughs> As soon as, uh, you know, I feel the urge to or whatever, that's a lot of boring. Every significant relationship makes demands, that's all. And the more significant the relationship is, the more important the demands are. And that's how we should understand the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments tell us how God wants us to relate to him and how God wants us to relate to one another and to ourselves. So, I would like to pose this image in contrast to these images you see in the USA. And to go back to what I was saying earlier, most people who have problems with religion picture God as the great lawgiver. You know, telling people to eat their vegetables and forbidding them to have fun. Whereas, God is the God of chesed, everlasting love, steadfast love, enduring love. Forgiving love, the God of mercy. So, besides the moral tradition that is so strong in our church, we also have a mystical tradition. A mystical tradition. So, when we look at the mystics, and when we look at the way great saints talk about their prayer, <clears throat> this is what we're looking at. The ways in which Catholics through the centuries have experienced God's chesed, God's great love. And the fact of the matter is, you don't have to be a mystic in order to experience that. God is offering this love constantly. Constantly. He breaks out of that hiddenness I was talking about earlier when he reveals his ways to Moses, the prophets, Jesus, the church. What he's doing when he breaks out of that hiddenness is he's making his chesed known and inviting us to respond. So, last thing I want to say is um, we Christians do not have one authoritative image for God, if you will. We have three. God is not simply one. He is also, in some sense, we will never understand. He is also three. Three and one. So, we have three ways of looking at God. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit. <clears throat> Be very careful 
When we talk about images of God, we are not simply talking about the God of the Old Testament. Okay, the God of the Old Testament is the Trinity before it is known as such. All three persons of the Trinity are active in the Old Testament. And I will, I will say this, uh, I hope a, a Jewish person would not be offended to hear this, but Christians very much believe that the Trinity is still at work within Judaism although it is not known as such. The Trinity is not known as such. So the Father is not simply the God of the Old Testament. The Father is the God of Jesus Christ. So, and, and Jesus clearly loved the Father and knew the Father's love for him. And that love made it possible for Jesus to obey. As he did. That's the Father. The Father is the Father of love. Then we have the Son. The Son is the easiest one to talk about. He's the image of God. He is the one who makes God knowable. The definitive way in which God breaks out of his hiddenness and makes himself known to us. So the, the Son was an excellent teacher. The Son was an excellent example and guide. But we don't leave it there. It's not that we the Son gave us an excellent story. The New Testament or the Gospels. And, you know, it's been the source of a lot of good movies. And bad ones too, by the way. Jesus didn't do this to entertain us. He didn't simply come to set an example, but he came to give us grace. And all grace is the, the grace of Christ, the grace of Jesus Christ. So everything that he is, he imparts to us. And this can come to focus for us in the, uh, the sacrament of the Eucharist. <laughs> he gives himself to us. He gives his life to us. He becomes a part of our life. In the same way that our food becomes a part of our body, Jesus becomes a part of our life. But the greater meaning of the Eucharist, St. Augustine is the one who talked about this, the greater meaning of the Eucharist is not simply that he becomes a part of us, but he makes us a part of himself, a part of his mystical body. So there is a lot to that second image, the image of the incarnate son. Then you have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, like the Father, is not visible in this story. But he's known especially by his effects in the church. So it's the Holy Spirit that conforms us to Jesus. It's the Holy Spirit that brings Jesus to us, brings us to Jesus. It's the Holy Spirit that forges the bonds in the church. It's the Holy Spirit that continues to teach us through the church. This is very Catholic. Jesus promised his disciples in the Last Supper discourses of John, he promised them the Spirit. And it is the Spirit of truth that he promises. And that Spirit of truth continues to teach us through the church. So, um, to bring these three images into focus, I have one last image I want to talk about. The, this is a kind of rule of thumb, a nice way of talking about the church's experience of the Trinity. When we experience God as something beyond us, when we experience his otherness, his transcendence, his holiness, that is our experience of the Father. When we experience God as our companion, as someone who accompanies us on the way, someone who keeps us company through tragedies or whatever, that is probably Jesus. When we experience God within us, when we experience God's indwelling presence in our hearts, the dignity that he's conferring on us, that is the Holy Spirit. 
So God beyond is the Father, God with is the Son, God within is the Spirit. Last image. This is something that I, I've thought about and probably I've more experience than thought about. But um, this has to do with divine motherhood and the femininity of God. God, of course, transcends the distinction between man and woman. Catechism is very clear about this. And if it is difficult for us to pray with the image of God as our Father, it is permissible in private prayer to think of God as our mother. One of the most powerful personal images I have of God is uh, my grandmother, who lived with us and died when I was three. I remember her. I have only fragmentary members, memories of her, but I remember her. And at key moments of my life, I have felt her presence the way a child would experience grandma. It's a very powerful image of God. That's permissible. I think the ordinary way in which the church experiences the femininity of God is through Mary. Mary mediates to us the femininity of God. And she does it perfectly. So she remains a creature. Of course, we do not worship her in the same way that we worship God. But um, this is my, it's a private theological opinion of mine. But I think that this is the way in which God wishes to make the femininity of the divine. Uh, to make it known to us. So that's, that's yet another one. They, in one way or another, they all come back to this, though. And the last thing I want to leave you with is, this is the heart of the matter. God's chesed is the heart of religion. Morality follows from that. In the same way that love can transform our life, even when we're talking about significant others. Significant uh, human others. Has said is the heart of the matter. So I, I have time for just a few questions and then I need to leave. So uh, any questions or comments? Father, you know, we used to have the familiar um, with God. Yeah. If any of you were old enough to remember when our prayers in, included thee and thou, that's to and do. That's the familiar form of the word you. And so when I still have some of those old prayer books, I read them because it makes me feel more familiar with God. Um, now, we've gotten rid of the these and thous because to us in our language now, it sounds more formal, yeah, not that's less the formal. Thing. That's I hear the and thou, and oh my goodness, you know, when was this written? You know, uh, that's my usual response when I see something like that. But we were on a familiar first name basis with God when we had prayers that had thee and thou. I, part of what I whirl is to, in a sense, try to deal with and engage our culture. But this whole culture of this sense is so very different from the complete pulses of experience. And it is, as Catholics, part of our task then, is really engaging. Aging in any fashion that raises itself. Mm. It raises up the importance of this sort of testing way mm. world to build small community world. Mm. It's actually still a prominent part of the worldview outside the Western world. Yeah. What happened with us was um, Reformation, wars of religion, enlightenment. So and at each point, what's happening in that, I mean, most Westerners consider that to be an ascent, okay? I don't. I consider it to be a breakdown. <laughs> now, at every point, wonderful things happen. You know, despite the division of Christianity, one of the wonderful things that came out of the Reformation is the new appreciation of Scripture, which is a huge part of what's forming what I'm saying to you this morning. So um, the wars of religion, uh, you know, War is a terrible thing, but it also accomplishes things. 
and for better or for worse, that's what established the geography of contemporary, the, the political geography of contemporary Europe. The Enlightenment gave us a much stronger sense of the individual and individual rights, but because of the Enlightenment, we think of ourselves as individuals now, not as a tribe. And that's the breakdown that I'm talking about. And it continues. So um, the widespread acceptability of divorce, no-fault divorce, okay? Maybe that was good for some people, and maybe divorce is a necessity in society, but not when over half of all marriages are failing. That, there's something wrong with that. And then, you know, the breakdown continues. We've separated um, love and sex. We, celebrate, we separated reproduction and sex. And what we're ending up with is a real mess, a real mess. Now, what, what Nick is saying, I agree with wholeheartedly. But this is one of the places where we see cultural assumptions are affecting us internally. So besides talking about said we have to live it. We have to live that kind of sturdiness, that kind of solidarity. And that's not easy for people that think of themselves as individuals. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's a huge challenge. Thanks for that observation. And when you talk about wars on, of religion, a lot of times they're using God as a reason for the war, but that really isn't the yeah. reason for the war. And when we don't show testing, then we can't see what they're doing. <clears throat> Seems like the task is to increasingly become a sinner. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I, I don't think those two words are really <laughs> the Hasidim. The Hasidim are the pious ones. So that doesn't mean we have to let our four lines go. Bill? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we all grew up, you know, learning the Ten Commandments, probably the first thing. And when Jesus came, he gave us the Beatitudes. Um, was the Beatitudes, was he trying to teach us that concept? I mean, is that what the Beatitudes really, how we should live our life? The best the way I've ever heard the Beatitudes described is um, <clears throat> they are a self-portrait of Jesus. So they are a self-portrait. I don't, I don't remember, it's not my insight, but I don't remember where I read that. But that's, yeah. In Matthew's Gospel, and in the Sermon on the Mount in particular, Jesus is, is portrayed as the new lawgiver. So, but the, the Beatitudes are the first thing that he says, and in many respects, the most important part of the Sermon on the Mount. And then remember, he goes through and he tells you, it was said, you know, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. He does it with a number of fixtures of, of the law, and then gives his interpretation. But it all goes back to the Beatitudes, which are a self-portrait of the one who lays down his life for his friends. Father, just kind of following up on that, um, Jesus said that he came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. Right. How is that fulfillment seen in relationship to Hesed that you're talking about? Well, he came, first of all, as an act of Hesed. So he's the redeemer. He's the one that's coming to the captives. You know, we are, in, in effect, we are the spoils in the house of the strong man, who is Satan. He comes as an act of hesed, he overpowers the strong man, and he sets us free. That's all an act of hesed. So, in, in, when, as St. Paul says it in, uh, in Galatians 5, 1, he sets us free for freedom. Sets us free for freedom. So um, he makes it possible for us to respond now to God's hesed. He makes it possible. He makes it possible by his grace, makes it possible for us to avoid sin and to become more loving reflections of him and, and what he is. Okay, I need to go. Thank you all. Thank you.